we get two, uh, two sessions on COPD, and I'm going to sort of kick off the morning part. We'll talk about it also after the break this afternoon. We'll talk a little more about in-depth treatment and things we can do this afternoon. This morning I'm going to talk about um, sort of the conundrums that come up with COPD and some of the things that can occur with it that are difficult to diagnose. And we'll talk a little bit about treatment as well. COPD is remarkably prevalent. It's the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, a lot is due to smoking. We have high prevalence of smoking, which is decreasing, thank goodness. But although this is the first year smoking's gone up, um, kind of sad, but recently we've had a, an uptick in smoking overall. It is a huge problem in the United States. And those of you who are office-based docs who take care of COPD patients, God bless you. Um, it is an incredibly difficult long-term disease to take care of. Those of us in the emergency department to take care of this disease need to know the pitfalls of this and what works and what doesn't. And I want to start, before I get into this, I want to mention a, a, a concept when you read literature that's related to both COPD and asthma. If you pull the literature on these diseases, you have to be very careful how you interpret the results of these, disease, these papers. Acute exacerbations of those conditions of asthma and COPD are distinctly different entities than is chronic stable management of those entities. And some of the papers, we'll go through them and I'll point them out, blend their sort of conclusions by taking both patient populations, acute and chronic, into their, po into their study. I think we have to be very careful to separate them out, particularly with COPD. Turns out that chronic management of COPD is a really distinctly different, so is asthma as well, but COPD significantly distinctly different than the acute management of that disease. And it's, it's very important to tease those two things out. So I want to sort of start with that concept. So as we go through these, as you look at these abstracts, and I'll, there's a gazillion in here, so I'll point out the ones that are most important to you so you can make a circle. But I want you to kind of focus on that and make sure that, depending on what you do in your day-to-day -day practice, make sure that the paper is answering the question you want answered. Are you an office based person where you really want to know chronic stable management or are you an emergency person where you take care of acute exacerbations or both and I think so you need to kind of tease that out and it's it's um, the literature is it, you can it can be a pitfall for you if you don't make sure you dis distinguish the two so let's start with it with sort of a couple of the conundrums that come up with acute exacerbations one is the concept of pulmonary embolism in COPD patients do they get them yes do they get them a lot Perhaps. The first four papers in here look at this, and I'm going to sort of tell you some data and then give you what I think is probably a reasonable recommendation. Um, abstract number one looks at inpatients and outpatients. It's probably the best paper of the four that are in this section. That looks at 550 patients overall who come in with ex acute exacerbations of COPD. All of them had workups for pulmonary embolism, which tells you that there's a skewed study already. There's a skewed population there already. Somebody already went and did the study. So they were worried about them already. But what they found is that overall, the, um, the proportion of PEs in this group of acute exacerbations was 20%, one in five. Now, they did pull out those that were just ED patients that went home. That was 3%. And they separated that. <laughs> That's still, think about the last 30 patients you saw with COPD in the emergency department. That says one in one of them had a pulmonary embolism. I, I doubt all of us diagnosed a PE in one of the last 30 COPD patients we saw. The other, it also says that one in five hospitalized patients, particularly with severe COPD, had a pulmonary embolism. Now, this study did look at people at presentation. There are studies that have also, there are a couple in here, that abstract number two, looks at studies of people that are in the hospital with COPD. And the odds are somebody with a bad COPD exacerbation who's hospitalized has a one in four shot of having a pulmonary embolism. Now, I don't know what to do with that. Honestly, I don't know what to do with that. I think the best clinical, and, and just as an aside, one of the things they did find as well, if you're a risk stratifier, PE is the other. To me, if I make it to heaven, there's a lot of question. But if I make it to heaven, I want to talk to God about several things. One is, why is the female urethra so close to everything else down there? You just shouldn't be there. I want to talk to God about why there's so many bones in the face, because they're just so hard. It's like, there's just too many there. It's too hard to figure out where the fractures are. And I want to talk to God about giving me a better way to diagnose pulmonary embolism. That's a pain. This is a similar problem. And if you are a risk stratifier for pulmonary embolism, so you go through the Wells criteria, or whatever you use to risk stratify for PE, which you should, it turns out that about 10%, 9% of these PE patients with COPD were low risk. Now, if you look at the low risk criteria, one of the things that puts somebody in low risk criteria is alternate diagnosis more likely than pulmonary embolism. 
okay, I have a barrel chest, I'm a pink puffer, I'm huffing and puffing away, I have no air movement. I think I have an alternative diagnosis there for that person to be short of breath. This is a big conundrum. I don't think what you should take home from this, the prevalence is high, worth knowing. Hospitalized, worth knowing, you've got to think about it. Acute onset, think about it. Pleuritic chest pain, think about it. Look at those legs, are they a little asymmetric? Think about it. Do you have to work them all up for it? No. Can you use a D-dimer to help risk stratify? Maybe, although D-dimers tend to be high in this patient population, just in general. So you're already kind of painting yourself into a bit of a corner. Can I give you a clear cut thing to do with this? Can I tell you what to do? No, I think what you have to be overall is be a good clinician. And if it's like, you know, this patient just says this is worse than usual or it came on differently this time or their legs are a little asymmetric or something isn't the same as their usual exacerbations. When you see them up front with their acute, acute exacerbation, think about it. And the more severe they are, the more likely to consider the diagnosis. Can you, you know, I, I don't know how to, to, should you work them all up? No, that's nuts, that's crazy. You can't work them all up, but know that the prevalence is high. And it probably is a low of 3% and a high of 25%. That's a pretty big range and that's a pretty significant risk. So, yeah. Oh, good question. And th that's a, no, and that's a very good question. Now, most of these were clinically significant in that they were um, segmental or subsegmental. They weren't way out distally. And the problem with PE in a COPD ear is that PE in itself is a histamine releaser. It causes bronch it can cause bronchospasm. So it kind of clinically significant PEs in a COPD ear may be different than a clinically significant PE in a walking, talking, normal, healthy person. So I think it's a little different to define in this patient population. I think it has a more likelihood of being clinically significant because they're sick already. Now that's PE. How about CHF? So let's kind of scooch on to the next section. How about a, D, a, B, or excuse me, a BNP? I really hate BNPs, I gotta tell you. I only hate them less a little bit than D-dimers, but they're, they're in the same box. And in fact, we have, we have um, NPs now out at triage that do all of our medical screening. They do, and God bless them, they have a job that I wouldn't want in a million years. They do all of the medical screening at a very busy county hospital. And for a long time, they were ordering the BNP D-dimer troponin triumvirate, which got, you know, anybody who had pain sort of from their nose to their knees got a BNP, a D-dimer, and a troponin, which left me in the back with, you know, what in the hell do I do with this troponin of 257? You know, our cutoff of positive is 250. You know, what do I do with this? Or a troponin of 0.04, uh, yeah, what do I do with this? I don't know what to do with this thing. BNP, you have to be careful how you use. Who gets an elevated BNP? Why does it go up? Atrial stress. Atrial stress, okay. It's basically brain type, nat natriotic, pet or, you know, natriotic petra. It comes from stress stretching your heart. Right. What stretches your heart? Heart failure does. PE, what else? Is it just your left heart? Renal failure. No, renal failure bumps it because it doesn't go away. It sticks around for a long time. What about, let's see, I'm a copd -er with really bad pulmonary hypertension from my COPD, so I have right-sided heart failure. Is my BNP gonna be up? You betcha, it certainly is, absolutely is. So first of all, understand what a BNP is. It is not specific to left heart failure. It just isn't. There are a lot of other things that cause it. So you're that abrupt onset COPD patient, I have terrible shortness of breath all of a sudden, and it's from a PE, my BNP may be up. Be careful with, with the BNP in and of itself. Does it help you? It's good to, so you, by the way, so you can have it with a PE, right heart failure, pneumonia, if it's bad enough, can elevate your BNP. Severe COPD exacerbations just from stressing the right side of the heart itself. Sepsis can do it. Volume overload can do it. I can do it to any one of you if I were to dump in eight liters of normal saline right now and throw you, I could do it. I could, I could get all of your BNPs elevated. So you have to be careful how you interpret this. And it was touted, there, uh, so let me tell you about the papers on this that initially came out saying, I know, I know your dilemma. You people on the front line, you have a COPD or there, but it could be a little bit of CHF. You've got to decide, do you give Lasix or do you give an inhaled beta agonist? Let me help you. I'll give you the test that will tell you which of those diseases it is and what treatment to use. The, those, those were the initial papers that came out and they were all initially sponsored by the company that produces the BNP test there's a, all kinds of fancy names. I love this, the BNP, the Breathing Not Properly Study. 
get off yourself. What is this all about? They had all these, there were a bunch of these that came out. And there's an offshoot of that study in here so you can see it. I'll tell you the problems with a lot of these studies that look at BNP, especially in COPD, but BNP in general. What was their gold standard of what the ultimate diagnosis was? Whether you decided whether it was COPD or CHF or not or whatever. What was their gold standard? Cardiologists looking at the data later. Not up front when you're trying to make a decision. Cardiologists look at the data later. And if you look at abstract number seven, the cardiologists that look at the data don't always agree with each other. 10% of the time, they said, you ignorant slut, it's not CHF. <laughs> yes, it is. It is CHF. No, I don't think that patient had CHF. So they didn't necessarily agree with each other. The gold standards on these studies are problematic because they use somebody sitting out there in Never Never Land who never saw the patient, who, has, who looks at some stuff on a piece of paper in a chart, doesn't even necessarily ever see the patient, and makes a decision whether you were right or wrong. I have problems with that. What I would love them to do is do an echo on every single one of those patients and tell me if there's diastolic dysfunction, show me what their LV says, Don't, do something objective, don't get some cardiologist sitting in a room telling me if I'm right or wrong, looking at stuff later. I have a big problem with those kinds of studies. So if you look at this overall, I want you to circle abstract number, it's Yeely's 10. It's actually not a paper, it's an opinion piece and it's absolutely beautifully written. And it does summarize what the majority of the literature say, says, which says the following. You as a clinician are very good at saying, you know, I think this one's CHF. You know, I think this time it's COPD in this patient that's the problem. You are really good. And if you are confident, when you walk away from your assessment of the patient's bed, you're at the bedside, you're listening, there's some rowels and their JBD is up a little bit and they've got some orthopnea and there's not that much wheezing and you think it's failure this time. Or you walk away, they're wheezing like crazy, there's, you know, their JVD is up because they have right sided heart failure, they might have some peripheral edema, but there's no crackles in there and you're sure it's COPD. You're right. The BNP doesn't help you. And in most of the time, if you send it in those cases, it's indeterminate, right? It's not negative, it's indeterminate. Well, your clinical decision is appropriate most of the time. Where BNP might be helpful to you is if you're not sure when you walk away from the bedside. And it's usually helpful if it's low. What they've found in these studies is that your clinical decision is great most of the time. Don't, so don't order it routinely to make your decision if it's the CHF this time or COPD in this patient. Don't use it to make your decision. When you should use it is when you're not quite sure, and the best way to use it is if it's negative. And, that's, and actually abstract number, uh, I think it's number six, basically says that exact thing. Most of the time when the BNP was obtained and it helped you clinically, it helps you because you ended up saying, yeah, it's just COPD, I don't need Lysix. You know, it's negative. So use your clinical judgment most of the time. Don't use the BNP to make your decision whether it's CHF or COPD unless you have some degree of uncertainty and then it's most useful when it's low. Okay, so that's the best way to use BNP. And remember, a really bad COPD exacerbation may bump the BNP because the right side of the heart is being strained. So know that it doesn't mean it's necessarily congestive heart failure. So use your clinical decision. And Yeely's um, discussion is well worth a read. It's very nice. It's very cogently written. Um, very nice piece, piece of writing there to help us. How about the, of the triumvirate, we've talked about sort of the PED dimer issue, the BNP issue. How about troponins? COPD or comes in, my chest is really tight. It's hard to breathe. Yeah, it, it's, there's tightness and yeah, it, it hurts some. What do you do? Okay, let's send a troponin in those. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with that? It's okay to do. What's the problem? What, why does your troponin go up? It's, well, it's heart damage, but a couple things happen with, you can have, your troponin is not, is it specific to an MI or acute coronary syndrome? No, it is not. And in fact, if you look at the paper, there's two papers in here, there's a bunch more out in the literature though that basically say troponins, if, if you are concerned, it's okay to send. If it is elevated though, don't, don't write it off to ACS. And in fact, in COPDers, it's about 10 to 12%, abstract to this, the second abstract in here, Harvey's abstract, basically comes out with 12%. And that's what most of the literature has. Yes, these people have coronary artery disease. However, today's COPD exacerbation is rarely caused by an MI. And what they did find, and the reason it is probably worth thinking about sending a troponin, is if they're really sick and they're hospitalized and their troponin is elevated, their mortality rate is double. 
It just means that that's a bad COPD exacerbation. They're straining their heart significantly. They've had a bit of a troponin leak, and it does double their mortality rate. So it does give at least the admitting doc some idea of, ooh, this one's a little sicker than I thought they might be. I've got to watch this one. So troponin, if you think it's an MI, sure, go for it. If it's there a little bit chest tightness, should you send it as a routine? Not necessarily, but if it's up, no, it's not necessarily from an MI. It may very well just be that they have a terrible COPD exacerbation. So that's sort of the pitfalls of the acute presenting copd -er. How about treatment? The whole next section, and from this sort of on, what we'll do this afternoon as well, is get into the idea of treating COPD. And before I get into the data, I want to talk about the disease. What is COPD? Why is it different? It is different from asthma. Why is it different from asthma? What is COPD? What's wrong in there? What's wrong with their lungs? We've got, what, so tell me one thing. At, they're absent. There are three alveoli in there trying very hard to diffuse oxygen. So there's destruction. What else do they have? Chronic inflammation. inflammation. And what's the third component? We hear it. We, what causes wheezing? Spasm. COPD is three things, OK? Asthma is not. Asthma doesn't have lung destruction. Asthma has inflammation and bronchospasm, both of which are potentially reversible components. COPD adds a third component, which is lung destruction. Now, the problem with that, I think, I think of COPD as a Venn diagram with those three components. And in any individual patient, so say you have an early COPD or who's mainly a chronic bronchitic. Well, that's a person where inflammation is a big problem, some bronchospasms in there, and not so much damage yet. Now you get to that end stage lunger who is three alveoli with two little columnar cells spitting out a little bit of inflammation and one sarcolem trying to spasm down down there. They don't have much bronchospasm and much inflammation left. If you think about that huge spectrum of how a COPD -er may present because of those three components of disease, it makes total sense that our treatment papers are all over the map on what works and what doesn't. Right? It makes sense. All COPDers are not the same. So you lump them all together in a paper that says, this works or this doesn't. You've got to keep in mind that, they, that each COPD or may not be the same as the next. One may have literally just lung destruction. One may have lots of inflammation and any spectrum in between. So as we get into the papers on this, I think it's helpful to understand that because it makes sense why if you are in practice and you know that your patient, Mr. Smith, does really well with inhaled corticosteroids, He's probably more of a bronchitic who has, who has the bronchitic component versus Mrs. Jones, who her salmeterol really helps her. Her epitropia really helps her. She's more of a bronchospastic person. And then there's that person who just needs HOMO2 and fingers crossed that they're going to last any time because there's only lung destruction left. So, so with that as sort of a platform to launch from, when we talk about treatment, I think it makes sense why some of the general sort of recommendations makes, you know, work and why some don't. And again, as I mentioned in the beginning, remember that acute treatment and chronic treatment are different. Okay, they are different. So we'll go into that as we go through this. When you look at every single one of these papers, what I did when I went through these papers is I highlighted stable, you know, stable or chronic versus acute, because you separate those instantly from the get-go as far as how you interpret whether the, the studies tell you if the, a treatment is effective or not. So that's sort of how we launch this. Let's talk about beta adrenergics, which is the whole first section here. And by the way, if you, one of the things I find frustrating as a doc is there is a plethora of literature out there. I mean, Rick has made 30 years of a career based on the literature out there. And for you as a person in the pit or a person in your office, keeping up is impossible. It's impossible. It's why you're here to try. There are certain guidelines that are worth keeping track of. The gold guidelines, Google Gold, capital G-O-L-D. These are, it's, it's called the Global Strategy for Diagnosis, Prevention, and Treatment of COPD. They're updated about every two years. They're, are some, they're worth a read. If you want a single place to go to tell you what to do about COPD, it's a good place to start. So if you really are frustrated in your office and you don't know what the latest and greatest is on beta agonists and chronic management, go there. And it has good references and hyperlinks to you to help you kind of keep up on this stuff. Because it's impossible. It's just impossible. That is a background. Let's talk a little bit about beta agonist therapy and COPD. If you are treating a stable patient, the literature in here basically says that beta agonist therapy buys you a little, 
has a potential downside, which is cardiovascular effects, um, and isn't the first line therapy. There's a whole bunch of papers in here, probably the single best, let me see if I have circled one here that's particularly good. Uh, I don't think there's one that's particular, probably the best one is 17, but it looks at, that looks at side effects more. What it basically says is beta agonists buy you some bronchodilation absolutely in chronic stable disease. But in chronic stable disease, it's not the beta, ag beta receptors that are the bigger problem. It's the anticholinergics, which we'll talk about, the cholinergic receptors. It does buy you some improvement. As far as the downside, it does have cardiovascular side effects, the most common of which is sinus tac. I don't really care a whole lot about sinus tac, to be honest with you. Unless somebody has terrible coronary artery disease, I don't care a lot about sinus tac. But there is a, an association with increased risk of cardiovascular death with chronic beta agonist use in COPD. It is just an association. It is not necessarily causation. It's been, there are multiple papers out there, especially with the long-acting beta agonists, that have found an association in people who use them and cardiovascular death. Now, the problem is people that need these drugs have bad disease, bad comorbidity, and I don't know if this is actually causing their problem or if it's their underlying medical disease that's causing their, their cardiovascular death, but know that there is an association in beta agonists. Now, in the acute setting, do they work? The data is not particularly strong. Okay, and again, that's because it's a mixed group. Some people are bronchospastic component ones. If you hear a lot of wheezing, go for it. Okay, go for it. If you hear a lot of wheezing, try it. Know that they, they will get sinus tac. They may have some problems with the cardiovascular side effects, but you go for it in the acute setting, have at it. In the chronic setting, there is some evidence that there's an association with cardiovascular deaths ultimately, and there's a modest benefit. What is better? are the anticholinergics. And that's the next section, which starts with the abstract number 20. The best one on this is 21. 21 is worth a pull. If you really want to look at an article that gives you all the sort of, at least up to 2006, latest and greatest on using anticholinergics in COPD, um, chronic stable disease, that's the one to pull. And what this one basically tells you is that anticholinergics are better than beta agonists. And they're better than as chronic management. They're better than beta agonists in um, risk of hospitalization, and they decrease mortality. Risk of, well, they don't decrease. They have a decreased risk of dying if you put somebody on a chronic anticholinergic. Which one you use is entirely up to you. There is a um, convenience factor in once-a-day dosing. Okay? We do have once-a-day dosing anticholinergics for chronic stable management. There, so there's a convenience factor that's in there as part of it. Just know that in general, the category of anticholinergics is, is the preferable drug for the bronchodilation dilation of the two but com compared to beta agonists. Can you use them both? Sure. But know that of the two, if you have to choose one, anticholinergics are absolutely the way to go. Now, in the acute setting, should we use them? Yes, but the data is less profound. So in somebody who is acute exacerbation, and it's interesting if you think about it, the, the cholinergic receptors are on the bigger airways, and the beta receptors are on the smaller airways. Maintaining those bigger airways open it, on a chronic basis is helpful. But on acute exacerbation, it tends to be the smaller airways that are the problematic airways. So it makes some sense that this may not be as helpful acutely as this. And chronically, this is what you need to keep open more. So the anticholinergics chronically are, are preferable. Acutely, go ahead and use them, but don't expect a ton from those. Okay, don't expect a lot from those. How about steroids? Should you be using steroids? We know for sure that in asthma, inhaled corticosteroids as an immune modulator are absolutely required in anybody with persistent asthma. And that's basically two exacerbations a month using two inhaler, it's the rule of twos. Absolutely the, the way to go. That's the first line therapy. Is it as strong data in COPD? Not so much. I will summarize the next set of papers for you because it includes Oral versus IV therapy, it includes, includes acute exacerbations and chronic treatment. In the, in the chronic setting, oral steroids don't tend to have a significant benefit and have a significant downside. And the data is pretty clear on this. If you go through these papers, there's a couple meta-analyses that are quite good in here that look at chronic, the downside is much higher than the benefit in chronic bad COPD. Now, some people will still need it just to be alive. But in general, between the hyperglycemia, the bone loss, the ulcer risks, the, the side effects, the number needed to harm is nine, the number needed to treat to get a benefit is seven. So on balance, 
in the chronic management of a COPD or steroids cause more harm than good. You have to make your decision in any individual case whether you use, this is oral steroids. You have to make a decision in any individual case whether you're gonna use them. Some patients may need them, but no, on balance, they cause more harm than good. Now how about inhaled corticosteroids on a chronic basis? It turns out that they actually probably have a little eensy benefit. So instead of putting somebody on a pill, put them on an inhaler. The price you're going to pay is an increased risk of pneumonia. It doubles their risk of pneumonia. Now it doesn't double any mortality related to that pneumonia, but it doubles the risk of pneumonia. It goes from about 4% to about 8% risk of pneumonia by putting them on an inhaled corticosteroid. So, so all that means is if you have somebody on an inhaled corticosteroid that's in your practice or, or somebody comes into us in the ER on an inhaled corticosteroid, you just have to raise the concern of them coming in as a pneumonia causing any, you know, any changes in their lung function. You know, they're a little short of breath today, they're coughing a little more, a little bit of a touch of a fever. You have to worry about pneumonia, somebody on an inhaled corticosteroid. In the acute management, somebody comes in really sick, ghastly, horrible sick, steroids actually are helpful. They decrease relapse rates if you send them home and they seem to decrease the length of stay in hospitals. It doesn't necessarily affect the need to be intubated. Um, that doesn't seem to have a strong effect, but it does decrease relapse rates for sure as far as people coming back. Oral versus IV, oral is fine. Does not need to be given the IV. The duration should be no longer than two weeks. It's been studied at two weeks, four weeks, and eight weeks. No increased benefit after two weeks. So two weeks, of, like you would do with an asthma exacerbation. Okay, give them some in the house, send them home with a five-day course for asthma. Here, maximum two-week course for COPD. So if you want to sort of summarize where we got so far with this talk, because we'll do the rest of the sort of stuff this afternoon, I want to kind of put it all together. Let me get my summary page here. COPD, fourth leading cause of death, big deal. Acute exacerbations, the risk of a PE in that exacerbation ranges from 3% to 25%. So put it on your radar screen. Okay, decide how you're going to approach it, but put it on your radar screen. BNP, only use it if you're not sure whether it's CHF or COPD. Okay, and then it's most useful if it's low to rule out the fact that fa failure is part of the deal. Troponins, whether you send them or not is up to you, but if it's positive, it increases their mortality rate by, by double. Okay, doubles their mortality rate. Um, as far as adrenergics, in the cro so chronic management, beta agonists give you a little bit of benefit, not much. Inhaled um, anticholinergics, absolutely one of the mainstays. Absolutely mainstay. As far as inhaled corticosteroids, worth it, but no, there's an increased risk of pneumonia. Oral's probably not worth it unless they're just terrible, terrible disease. Acutely, throw it all at them. Okay, throw it all at them. Give everything you can, knowing that if you give the steroids, give them orally, and only send them home with a two week course. So, and, and because, this is because it's such a complicated disease and it isn't one entity. It's not like I broke my bone. It's bronchospasm, inflammation, and destruction. It's a complicated disease to manage. Read your literature separating it acute from chronic so you know what you're getting. Any questions so far on this part of COPD management? Because we'll talk about some more this afternoon.